two, one. Hi everybody, this is E. Yang. I'm pharmacy manager and owner at Webb's Family Pharmacy here in town. And I'm here today with my student, uh, Mr. Santiago Navarro. He is a P4 professional student at the Manchester University School of Pharmacy. And we're happy to be here today to present COVID-19 vaccine uh, information uh, that's coming up. And I'll let Mr. Santiago Mr. Navarro actually introduced himself a little as well. Hello, my name is Santiago Navarro. I'm a fourth year student at Manchester University School of Pharmacy. I am, the school is located there in Fort Wayne. I'm doing my happy rotation here with Dr. Yang. I'm learning the business of pharmacy. But today we're going to talk about the COVID-19 vaccination and the information that's currently available. So what we'll be covering today so we're going to be covering the vaccine development, the safety data behind the vaccine, also common misconceptions, the myths, herd immunity, and then how you can protect yourself and your loved ones from getting COVID-19. So what is COVID-19? So as you can see here, COVID-19 is a virus that has these molecules out, outside here as you can see here pointing, this pink glycoprotein, which is a spike protein that enters the cell in your body. So what this vaccine does is this vaccine is made out of a, a messenger RNA, and it does not contain any live virus. This is a messenger strand that instructs the immune system to make antibodies so that if you do get exposed to COVID-19, it will prevent from you getting sicker. So once this injection is inside, it's inside the muscle, it will produce these antibodies that we will see in the next video. And then once the mRNA code is used, it will be destroyed since it's a foreign particle in your body. Now, just to remember, this is this video kind of goes over the process, and we'll explain later why the two companies that have developed the COVID-19 vaccine have chosen to use this process. Uh, it seems to be much speedier in terms of development, as well as proving its efficacy in terms of how effective the vaccine is at preventing COVID infection. Uh, it is a new technology, however, so that's why we are taking the time to explain it. Okay, so then play the video. So again, mRNA is a messenger RNA DNA strand that is used to copy genetic material into making a protein. So the process that these vaccine makers are using is to copy a part of the viral DNA and then use that to copy just one protein of the virus. So again, this vaccine that you will be receiving is not the entire virus. You will not get the COVID virus from the vaccine. The, the vaccine is only one protein that is being copied, and specifically it mimics that spike protein that's part of the outer shell of the virus. So by copying this spike protein, your body's immune system is responding to that protein, and it's, that's where the immune response comes from. The body recognizes the foreign protein and will elicit that immune response, and that is what creates that protection against COVID, the real COVID-19. So your body is gonna produce antibodies. So when your body actually encounters COVID-19, 
if you have already gotten the vaccine, your immune system will already be tailored to look for it. And that's why it can effectively block the virus. Now we can go ahead with the rest of the presentation. So for the Pfizer vaccine, they released their analysis of the data. So they released the efficacy trial. So with approximately about 40,000 participants in this clinical trial, it demonstrated an efficacy of 95%. That's pretty high for a vaccine. So essentially with all this new technology that's out there with vaccine development. So what they did also, they broke that down into further analysis based on comorbidity. So types of disease you see here in the American population, such as cardiovascular disease, so heart disease, you have chronic pulmonary disease, you have diabetes, obesity, and hypertension. As you can see here, so people that are, have no comorbidities, which is healthy individuals, it's 94.7% efficacy. People that have heart disease, cardiovascular issues, 100% efficacy. Chronic pulmonary disease, 93% efficacy. Diabetes, 94.7% efficacy. Obesity, 95.4% efficacy. And hypertension, which is blood pressure, 95.4% efficacy. So the Pfizer vaccine is what you would call the gold standard. So this is a vaccine that is both highly effective and also does not show any differences between age groups and people that have different disease uh, histories, let's just say. So a bad vaccine would be something that you would see which would provide maybe 50 or 60% protection and then you may not see as strong of a protection among uh, older adults. But this is not what we see from the data that Pfizer and later you'll see what the Moderna vaccine has released, which is that they are 95% effective across all age groups among people with all kinds of histories. So as you can see here, this is what was released just this Tuesday. So the Pfizer vaccine data and immune response. So these two circles here will tell you that on day, so on day zero is when you receive the vaccine. On day seven to 10, you see that immune response getting triggered, which is actually pretty outstanding for a new vaccine. And then on day 21, you see that booster vaccine that is required. And then you see the, the antibody plateau, which gives you that immunity to COVID-19. So to further break down this graph, so the red line that you see here is the, is the rate of people that have gotten COVID-19, the people that received no vaccine. The blue line is the people that have gotten the vaccine. So as you can see, starting on day 10, the 10th day after getting the vaccine, you're seeing a huge divergence where the people, the blue line, of the people that got the vaccine, they're not getting the virus. So you can see the blue line is almost a plateau. It has stayed around the same. Less than 5% of people that got the vaccine have gotten COVID-19. Whereas the red line is the people that have not gotten the vaccine. You can see that the rates just keep going up. So this is a very important chart that Pfizer has released. So we're further breaking down that Pfizer vaccine with the safety data. So most of the side effects were experienced after the second dose. So the general side effects that you would receive usually would be like injection and so the pain in the arm, also redness, tenderness. Um, but the interesting part about this vaccine is that it occurred less frequency, frequently in older adults that were greater 55 years or older. So it only occurred 2.8%. And it occurred more frequently in younger participants which was 
the two common, let's say, side effects that came out with this vaccine were appendicitis and swollen lymph nodes. But this only occurred, reported less than 1% of participants. So for the Moderna vaccine clinical trial, it demonstrated a 94.5% efficacy, which was established from 30,000 patients that were in that clinical trial. Unfortunately, there is not that much information right now since it's currently going through the FDA process, which will be later, they will release more information on December 17th, which is next Thursday. But at this time, Moderna is seeking emergency use authorization in multiple different countries. You can see the European Medicines Agency, which is the, the same as the FDA, the Health Canada, similar to the FDA, Switzerland, the UK, Israel, and Singapore. Now the Moderna vaccine is the vaccine that you will be receiving here at Timbercrest. Uh, it's gonna be administered uh, by CVS Pharmacy, I'm told, on three different uh, dates. And it will be as well a two-dose series. So you'll be getting on two days separated by, I believe, 21 or 28 28 days. days. By 28 days, yes. So, so each person that gets the vaccine will need to get two doses separated by 28 days. Now the Moderna vaccine is using the same technology, the mRNA that we presented earlier as the Pfizer vaccine. So we have between these two vaccine trials, almost 80,000 people who have already gotten the vaccine. And that's why we feel very strongly about the data that's come out. So between the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine, they've tested about 80,000 people and 95% of those people that have gotten the vaccine are protected against COVID. So that is about as great as data could allow in this time. And that's why we feel very confident about what's getting, that these vaccines will get approved by the FDA. And hopefully we can get them uh, into the market shortly. So the vaccine side effects from both arms of the Moderna and Pfizer as I told you earlier that most of the side effects were reported after the second dose. So here, the Moderna trial, the main two that commonly occurred with most of the patients were fatigue and muscle pain. But then some of them also complained of joint pain, headache, redness at the injection site, and then high fever. So this, this panel of side effects after the second dose, this is not unexpected. As many of you know, the people who have gotten shingles vaccine, many of you have gotten it from my clinic here at Timbercrest, will know that you get a bigger response after the second dose. So the reason for that is your immune system, remember, starts to build up immunity after the first dose. And that's the same thing that's occurring here with the COVID-19 vaccine. Your body, about 10 days after the first dose, starts building that antibody response that immune response. So by the time you get your second dose, your body is already reacting as if the virus is in your body, even though it's just a vaccine. So that's why you see that bigger reaction on the second dose. I expect the reaction to be very similar to what people experience with the shingles vaccine. And the most common, again, that Santiago went over, the effects are fatigue and muscle pain and headache, those seems to be generally considered to be the most common side effects. So for the Pfizer arm of the side effects, the, the most two common ones were, was the fatigue and headache. They have some people also complained of pain at the injection site, muscle pain, chills, joint pain, and fever. And as you can see, they have the same exact side effects which either vaccine. Now, the fever that some people have reported after the second dose, that is not due to COVID. So again, this is, this is a response from your immune system as if it, your immune system reacts as if you have the COVID virus, but it's just an immune response. This vaccine does not give you COVID. So even if you experience fever after the second dose, that does not mean you have COVID. So what are the benefits of getting vaccinated? As you can see, the COVID-19 vaccine, the vaccine will keep you from getting COVID, but getting vaccinated will protect you and your loved ones. 
especially people that have an increased risk of getting the disease and almost potentially of dying from the disease. As you can see here, these are some severe illnesses that are affected by this. So there's asthma, there's cancer, chronic kidney disease, dialysis, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, heart conditions such as heart failure or coronary artery disease. There's immunocompromised patients, obesity, severe obesity, sickle cell disease, smoking, and type 2 diabetes. Now, this COVID vaccine, they're still investigating whether getting the vaccine can prevent the spread of the virus from somebody who has been vaccinated. Uh, but I, I assume that it will improve people that have already gotten COVID as well. So people who have gotten COVID or who have experienced getting COVID, they can still get benefit from getting the vaccine. That's very important for people to remember, okay? Even if you've gotten COVID in the past, or you believe you were in contact with somebody and may have gotten exposed to the virus in the past, that does not mean that you should not get this vaccine. Everyone should get this vaccine because you're protecting not only yourself from getting it in the future again, and there's, there's evidence out there that shows someone can get COVID two or three times based on exposure. But there's also data that shows that if you are protected by this vaccine, you can stop it from spreading to, to loved ones and, and family and friends. And we all know how many we've lost over the past year. So it's very important that people remember what benefits you can get from getting the vaccine. Later on, we can actually go over some of the more encouraging data where it shows that even people who get the vaccine and then somehow get COVID, they're still protected against the virus. So they're not experiencing severe disease and they don't have to be hospitalized. So that's also very important. So we're continuing the benefits of getting this vaccine. So it will be, it's a safer way of getting an immunity towards COVID-19 than getting contracted the disease. As you know right now, the current, the current situation is to see the deaths rising day by day and people getting infected. This vaccine will protect you by creating the antibody response that you need to fight off this infection. So the COVID-19 vaccine will be one of the many tools being utilized in this pandemic to curb this spread of disease. So again, once this vaccine is given, remember to still mask up and keep social distancing because we need to get to that herd immunity, which is about an 80% of the population getting vaccinated. So we come to the part of the presentation where you've seen the myths out there in the internet or with the community saying that all these rumors and facts that you see probably on YouTube or Facebook or Instagram. So the first one that I've encountered myself is COVID vaccine will give you COVID. No, that is not true, it is actually false. It would actually prime the immune system, as we talked about Dr. Yang and I, how it will trigger that antibody response. So if you do get COVID-19, you will be able to fight it off. The second one is COVID-19 vaccine will be mandatory, false. The federal government will leave it up to individuals to get the vaccine, but there are some states and counties that will require this vaccine, not in Indiana. But we do highly encourage everyone to get it. COVID-19 will be administered by the military. No, that is not true. The military and Department of Defense is involved in the logistics of transporting the vaccines to the different destinations here in the U.S. and, uh, and the Pacific Islands like Guam. So they are involved in getting that vaccine immediately to the, to the destinations needed the most. The most common that I've seen is it's impossible to make a vaccine in one year. It's actually false again. So you can actually have an infectious and safety on a vaccine and there's many safeguards are, that are still in play to get this vaccine up and running. Now, part of the reason why the COVID-19 vaccine was developed so quickly is not only due to the health urgency of the, of the pandemic, but also because 
the federal administration provided a lot of federal funding, which allowed research to go on at rapid pace. Also remember these two vaccines by Moderna and Pfizer are using a new technology, which allows them to bypass some of the older, slower methods, but also to maintain the same efficacy as we have seen in the past. So that's why these are the first two vaccines that use this technology but have also shown to be very safe and very effective. So this could be the model going forward for any new viruses that come about. So this may be the, due to the new technology, it's not due to a lack of oversight, not, not due to a lack of rushing it out, just to put it out there. All the data that we have seen has shown that it is very safe and very effective. So we're continuing with the myths. So one of the other myths that I found online was COVID vaccine contains a microchip to trap you. Again, this is completely false. So they, there's actually chips in the shipment of the vaccine itself to make sure that it did get received out to the hospitals or to the community where it's destined to. So since this vaccine is very, it's like highly prized, that's why you wanna know that that vaccine gets to that location because there has been uh, news reports that there is people looking for this uh, vaccine interception. So another misconception was COVID vaccine will make you more susceptible to other illnesses. That is completely false. So the vaccine will actually boost your immune response again and will help you combat many other diseases, especially COVID-19. Another one that I've seen was COVID vaccine is a bigger risk than catching COVID itself. So false. As we see today and the data that we just saw this earlier this morning, COVID-19 is on track to be the leading cause of death, beating HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria worldwide. Another thing that I've seen is once I'm vaccinated, the pandemic will stop, right? Unfortunately, that is not true. At least, again, we're going back to the current immunity. Again, 80% of the population will need to get vaccinated to get this herd immunity going to reduce the transmission of the virus. And then the last myth that I found online was, the COVID vaccine from Moderna and Pfizer is made from aborted fetuses, the, the fetal cells. Again, this is false. Neither Moderna or Pfizer required fetal cells to make this vaccine. I went ahead and dug a little bit deeper and I found two, two articles, one from the Charlie Lozier Institute, which is a pro-life organization, and the America, the Jesuit Review. And they both looked at the clinical trial, and this is what they stated. So from the Charlie Lozier Institute says, vaccines are found to be ethically uncontroversial. And then for the America, the Jesuit Review, vaccines that are coming out are not even painted with that moral problem. So if it were me, I would get this vaccine. So here we're going to present a little bit more information about what and about how COVID is spreading and how we can prevent it with this vaccine. So we're going to talk about the epidemiology of the spread of, the, of COVID. So as you can see here, we have a patient here in the hospital and our duty as healthcare professionals, especially if you work in the hospital, you want to find out who was the patient in contact with. So then we can do contact tracing and we can, especially since as you can see here, this patient was affected with COVID-19, then affected these two patients, and as you can see, it's a domino effect, and it just keeps on growing, growing, and growing. So if we can prevent that from growing into a, maybe a quarantine of a few days, you will stop that spread around the community. So we're monitoring and, tra and tracking disease. So there's surveillance systems right now in place. So there's a, the John Hopkins University COVID-19 tracker, as well as state departments, and especially with the Indiana State Department of Health. They monitor new cases, hospitalization, deaths, and then also demographic, de demographic information. So how is herd immunity achieved? So one thing is you have to study the disease. So how is it spreading among the community? So as you can see here, this is the state of Indiana. This is just yesterday at 5 p.m. as you can see 
the whole state is affected with COVID-19. And as you can see the darker shade, that means more people are affected in that area. So for example, Wabash County, where the county of residence here, there's a 13% incidence rate at this moment in time. So what we need to do is develop guidance in order to prevent the spread. So refer to federal, local, and state guidance in order to prevent the spread. So our goal with the vaccine is that in order for our community to recover from this pandemic, we need to drive that incidence rate from 13% where it's now to probably less than 1%. And the only way to effectively do that is to get every, as many people, as you know, vaccinated against COVID-19. And we'll explain why in the next slide here with herd immunity. So the concept of herd immunity is something that's been around for a long time. And the idea is that in order to have a population that limits the spread of a virus, you need at least 70% of people that is immune to that virus. Now, contrary to some belief, the US is not at a herd immunity level. Actually, we're far from it. There's a lot of misinformation actually online about how a lot of communities are already close to herd immunity. And despite our hospital systems being overwhelmed, and we are seeing these high incidence rates and in ICU beds being filled to capacity, we're, surprisingly, our incidence rate is at 13%. And I, I think our general population immunity is around that same level. It's about 10 to 13%. So just think about that. So at 10 to 13%, our healthcare system is already being overwhelmed. So think about what it would look like if 70% of the population was infected with COVID. So that's why we're, we as healthcare professionals are saying that in order to prevent the spread of COVID, you need to get 70 or 80% of a community vaccinated and immune from COVID to stop the spread. And that way we can protect everybody. Now, if you imagine Timbercrest as a community, we need everybody who's involved at Timbercrest to reach that 70 to 90%, right? So we need staff, we need residents, we need visitors, we need everybody to get to that level in order to achieve herd immunity. And at that point, we can safely say, you know, we can finally get over this pandemic. So that's why it's so important. And that's why we're here today. And that's going to take time. Like I said, this vaccine is getting rolled out piece by piece, but as been determined by the CDC, the top priority right now is long-term care and nursing home residents. So that's why nursing homes are part of the phase 1A, and you'll be one of the first groups of people to get the vaccine. And that's just to show that based on the incidence and the risk to people that are over 65, that's why we are stressing that everybody who is involved in this community should be vaccinated if they get the opportunity to do so. I can speak for myself as a local healthcare provider, I will be getting the COVID vaccine as soon as it's available because I am a person of the community and I wanna protect those people that are in contact with me. Uh, Stan uh, has also said that he will be one of the first people to get vaccinated. And you also see a lot of uh, past presidents and people, you know, encouraging them, um, everybody to get vaccinated. So, so I think based on what we've presented today, uh, there, there is obviously a lot of apprehension out there and anxiety about what this vaccine entails, but there's nothing to be afraid of really, because at the rate that we're going, it's unsustainable. We cannot maintain the rate that we are going in terms of managing this pandemic. We're losing too many people. We're having too many people hospitalized. And it is unsustainable to go at this current rate towards herd immunity. The only way we can get over this pandemic is through the vaccine. So that's why we're here today. So when does herd immunity fail? So 
as we are just bouncing off of what Dr. Yang said is that community, so if people do not share that same belief about getting vaccinated, that's one of the breaking points with herd immunity. So people live in the same neighborhood without believing in the vaccination. Kids living in the same school without vaccinations, and then people attending the same religious services without vaccinations. So again, so the threshold that we need for herd immunity is that 70 to 90 percent. And if we don't have that threshold, that disease will spread throughout the community rapidly, as we will show you in the next slide. So as you can see here on the left, this is no herd immunity. So think about COVID-19 right now in the community. So if one person gets infected, you see that person infect others, 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 and it's again, a domino effect, and it just keeps on growing. Versus if there's herd immunity, so for this example, if most of the population, let's say 80%, is vaccinated, that one person out of five will be the only one getting that, that disease. And instead of it spiraling out of control, as you see right now on the slide on the left, we're gonna, we much prefer the picture on the right where we can manage the people getting sick because it's only one person spreading to one other person instead of one person spreading it to five or six people. So, so obviously that is the ideal model that we want to uh, develop for. So then one, one thing that I've found online is like, let's just get COVID-19 and like get over with it, right? No, I highly discourage that. So remember, COVID-19 is very different. It's a novel virus. Novel means it's a new virus that we have no information about. It's still being, it's still being identified. It's still being researched upon today. So COVID-19 carries much higher risk of severe disease that can result in hospitalization and even death as we are seeing today. Current data suggests that COVID-19 is 10 times higher than the annual flu. So I actually looked up data from the 2019-2020 flu season, and based on the best statistics from the CDC, only 22,000 deaths were associated with flu in 2019-2020. In so if you compare that with the COVID-19 deaths, we're talking about almost a 20-fold increase in, in, in deaths. So that just puts it in perspective that this is not a flu epidemic we cannot get through this without a vaccine. And again, <clears throat> we want to space out the infections in our time in order to give the resources available to healthcare workers and also hospital systems to treat the patients that actually get COVID-19 that need that extra level of care. What are the best ways to protect yourself from getting COVID-19? So one thing is know how it spreads. So, so far research and data show that it's spread by respiratory droplets. That's why we have these masks on us right now. So we, it's spread by coughing, sneezing, breathing, singing, or even coughing within close contact to an affected individual. That's why we recommend at least a six feet distance from one another. And then remember that people that do not show symptoms can still transmit the disease. So it's very imperative that you know whether that person is sick or not. One, one thing you can do is wash your hands. Use soap and water. If soap and water is not available, you can use regular sanitizer, but it has to be at least 60% alcohol to kill the virus. And then also, more, one of the more, more important things is avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Those are the most frequent points of contact in contracting the virus. So remember that these are the best practices even if you receive the vaccine. So many of you will be receiving the first dose of vaccine before Christmas. But remember, you're not fully protected against COVID until you receive the second dose. So those of you who choose to get the COVID-19 vaccine before Christmas, you still have to follow these best practices over the Christmas and holiday period to protect yourself and your loved ones. We're just continuing the best way to protect yourself. So avoid close contact with people that are sick. So maintain your distance of about six feet. Cover your mouth and nose with a mask. Also, it prevents from getting and spreading the virus. Last but not least is cover your cough and sneezes. So you throw away the used tissues in the trash, cover it with your elbow, 
and then immediately sanitize your hands or wash them for at least 20 seconds. Just some more data about protecting yourself. So frequently clean and disinfect areas of high, of high traffic, so such as doorknobs, um, the desk, Door handles. Door handles, thank you. <laughs> and then uh, again, you can use detergent or even soap and water to disinfect. Monitor your, and then most importantly, monitor your daily health on the daily. So watch out for any signs of fever, cough, shortness of breath. Those are the three cardinal symptoms right now with COVID-19. And then if available, take your temperature daily to monitor to see whether you're in the higher or the lower end. Here is our list of references that we use to make this presentation. Um, and obviously, I'm always here in the community and at the pharmacy. So if anybody has any questions and they have questions about something that we talked about during this presentation, feel free to call us at the pharmacy and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for having us.